Now, amidst all of this, one major concern that remains is that of the status of women. Because the Taliban made it clear in a press conference last night that they will impose the Sharia law in the country. Where does that leave women who were in Afghanistan looking for freedom and independence and their rights? If the Taliban's past is anything to go by, troubled times lie ahead for women in Afghanistan. What's the reality? We'll be joined by some leading Afghan women voices. But first, here's a report. زودتر ادارات دولتی بیشتر فعال خواهد شد تمام کارمندان خواهد آمد آمدن با شمول اوناس انشالله بخش های مختلفی که برشان تعین است یا قوانین اسلام و شریعت اجازه می تند The Islamic Emirates of Afghanistan is reborn. The new regime, the shape of which is still to be decided, will follow the Sharia. For women, this will mean relegation to the margins. Though the Taliban has said it will let women work and study, the situation on the ground has given Afghan citizens reasons to worry. While the Taliban has announced a general amnesty, they have taken Salima Mazari, the governor of Balkh province, into custody. The current whereabouts of Salima, who had fought the Taliban, are unknown. On the streets, the common citizen is scared. Owners of beauty salons are already removing pictures and even blackening posters of women in Kabul. Women are mostly staying at home to avoid any trouble. Two days ago, I, I, I uh, d d don't see, uh, see uh, any uh, girls in the in, uh, street, um, uh, uh, in street in Kabul. They are afraid, they are scared from the uh, Taliban. Girls staying at home, if it becomes a norm, changing that would not uh, be an easy task. And I don't want it to become a norm. Girls in schools are important and I'm not willing to give up on that. The memories of Taliban's first regime 20 years ago still haunt the women of Afghanistan. The women could not step out of their home if not accompanied by a male. Any violation of this rule would result in public beatings. Burqas were mandatory. Those not wearing one faced public lashing. The law also prohibited education for females. The women went through severe health care crisis due to the strict prohibition of male-female contact. The Taliban had mandated segregation of patients and staff of two genders in hospitals. All said Afghanistan of 2021 is different from 1996. Murmurs of disapproval are already being heard. Protests were held in Jalalabad where people took down the Taliban flag, unfurled the red, green and black national flag. The Taliban fighters opened fire on the protesters and then assaulted journalists. In another show of courage, women were seen in Kabul, shouting slogans demanding equal rights while surrounded by armed Taliban. The women of Afghanistan want their voice to be heard. But will the Taliban listen, take heed? report in there today so will the Taliban shackle women in their country will they actually ease their the curbs they had put in Taliban 1.0 is Taliban's new face as they are calling it simply a public relations stunt how can the world ensure that the Taliban honor women's rights joined by some very special guests Roya Ramani is former ambassador of Afghanistan to the United States till not long ago Kamila Siddiqui is former Deputy Minister for Commerce Afghanistan. Pashtana Durani is Afghan women and education rights activist. Dr. Homira Riza is important. She's a Hazara activist. Hazaras have been targeted by the Taliban in the past, so she faces double uh, discrimination in a way. And we'll also hope to be joined by Mursal Nurzai, activist. Thanks all very much for uh, joining me. I want to come first to you, uh, uh, Roya Ramani. Give us a sense of what you see happening in your country at the moment. Is the clock being turned back to 20 years ago when women were denied what 
the world saw as their basic freedoms? Is that the real fear you have, Roya? It is something uh, that remains to be seen. Of course, as you cover, Taliban are coming to a new Afghanistan. A new Afghanistan is not only the one that, uh, where its people have had a lot of progress. Mm -hmm. uh, women have uh, enjoyed over the past 20 years the kind of rights and liberties that have been unprecedented, that they had so many achievements and ability to join all forms of uh, activities and positions and uh, uh, professions, but it's also a different Afghanistan because it is uh, the people have already been exposed uh, to the rest of the world. They are connected to the rest of the world, and at the uh, same time, they are hungry for justice. They are uh, really looking uh, for a possibility to uh, live in. in um, but do you in see it happening, ma'am? Do you see it happening? That's the hope. But do you see it happening? Do you really believe? That the Taliban, there, is, there are reports coming in that in some parts, particularly in Kandahar, of women who've been forcibly removed from their bank jobs, who are being asked to go back to their homes, the fears in places like Herat, where over the years many women have got education in universities. Do you fear the worst? While you're hoping that this will happen, you fear, do you fear the worst? Oh, absolutely. The, the issue is, uh, look, right now, the women of Afghanistan are the ones that will be losing the most. The women are the most vulnerable, and also they are the determining factor of what is going to happen to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. If their rights and liberties are respected, that is, Afghanistan will be in the right course, and the mm -hmm. uh, terrorism and extremism will be prevented from spreading to the region. If women are abused, if women are oppressed, which is something that we we all fear extremely at this point. Women are very much afraid. You just covered that mm -hmm. they are not coming out of their homes. And, and, it, and it's not only the women, also the rest of the population, having experienced the harsh treatment of women back 20 years ago, they are uh, out of fear. They are already contributing to the, to the um, uh, revival of that culture. As you see that they are uh, uh, covering the posters of women. Uh, they, they are uh, already dressing in ways that, that uh, would not draw attention of Taliban to them. So there is a culture of fear very dominantly uh, shaping and uh, spreading. Uh, now, uh, again, and based on the announcement that the Taliban has made, they say that they are allowing women, but in accordance to Sharia law. Afghanistan is a Muslim let me, country. Let me it come. has always been a Muslim country. What Sharia law? Whose interpretation? Whose viewpoint? If it is going to be the same as the 20 years ago, of course this would be uh, very, very severe and harsh on women. You mentioned a very strong point. Whose Sharia law? Who's going to interpret that Sharia law? Because that's what the, Afghanis, uh, the Taliban leadership says. Mur Mursal Nurzai, your response to that as someone who's fought against these very forces that today have come to power, what's your sense? Interpretation of Sharia law, whose interpretation? That of the Taliban leadership? Um, uh, thank you for having me. And as my um, fellow sister just mentioned, um, and as everyone is asking, what Sharia law are we talking about? Because if, they, um, uh, if Taliban um, so-called soldiers wants to uh, wants to wants to bring Islam in the name of Islam and wants the want the woman to follow the Islamic rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. Just to quote one of my very uh, very favorite quotes and very important topic from an Islamic history uh, perspective. Um, the last prophet, uh, first wife was a, a trader. She was a business lady and she was a um, working lady and she was not forced to sit at home. So, um, is this the picture of Islam that really Islam is? This is the one that we know. But what kind of Sharia law they are talking about, where women will not be um, allowed to take part in sports, mm -hmm. um, in education, in medical care, which is very, very, very important. Um, we and 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 just just to add on on what my um, sister said. Um, Afghanistan was not like this before. Afghanistan, if we can go back to the history, mm -hmm. the achievements have been uh, from 1919 uh, till 1929 during the King Amanullah. Um, uh, he has made, along with his wife, uh, major big 
um, uh, women movements. They, they, they work for women's rights. They, mm -hmm. they uh, forced uh, or they enforce the laws that mm -hmm. women should take education, get education. They should go and work. Uh, they should be getting the equal rights as the men. Mm -hmm. So the question is, who is supporting Taliban? Where is where is the order coming? Right. I cannot believe that the Pal Taliban had the power from one day to the other to take over Afghanistan from out of nowhere. Within five days, they took over the whole Afghanistan. Within the first three days, 28 children died. 136 children were injured and thousand civilians died. So I ask myself, if Taliban were restricted, mm -hmm. where the we weapons came from, how that's, did they... You know, that, I take that. I want to focus at the moment on just the rights of women. And that's, you know, that I, I, at the top, that's what my producer also needs to focus on. This is about the women of Afghanistan because they, at the moment, are the ones who feel perhaps the most fearful of what lies ahead. Dr. Homira Rizai, you're a Hazara activist. And for our viewers, remember, the Hazaras are the ones who've been targeted in the past by... Uh, the Taliban. We've already had a statue of one of your leaders being demolished today. Do you fear the worst that Hazara women in fact will face double discrimination, women and Hazaras? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we've already seen many cases around Hazara Jata where the Taliban have been targeting them. These were Hazara rights activists, the female uh, mm -hmm. uh, human rights defenders. Uh, these are the women that genuinely led the development of the civil society in Afghanistan. And as you said, the Hazara women, they are a double threat because one, they're women and second, they're Hazaras. And unfortunately, they are under attack. They are in, in, in grave danger in Afghanistan. And unfortunately, these are the very people that have been abandoned in Afghanistan. You know, that's the tragedy that these are the very women, as you say, who've been abandoned by uh, uh, by the Taliban. Uh, Kamila Siddiqui, this whole Sharia law debate, you know, let's be clear, there are across the Islamic world today, without being, uh, you know, trapped in political correctness, women have found in several countries their freedoms being, in a way, limited. Do you believe that the Taliban will, will once again make it even more difficult for women to go out there and enjoy the rights they did? You know, look at what Afghanistan has been. In the 1920s, this was a country where women got the right to vote. 15% of your lawmakers in 77 were women. 70% of school teachers in 1990s were women. 40% of doctors in Kabul were women. What happens to that? Will we go back to the bad old times? Uh, thank you so much for having me in this important discussion. Um, as you know, that the difference is, there is a big difference uh, between the women that uh, you talk about uh, 20 years ago and right now. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of professional women that I, I think it will be difficult for Taliban to discuss with them about Sharia and Islam. Because we have a lot of women, educated women in, in, in Afghanistan. There is a lot of women, not only in, in Islam, but a lot of professional women that they are working in different sectors mm -hmm. uh, in Afghanistan, in, in different provinces. But, but can, think, they, can uh, they stand up, ma'am? Can they stand up, you think? Can a woman stand up or can civil society, not just women, men, women stand up if, as we are now hearing reports in some parts of Afghanistan, if the Taliban do not allow them to go to work, do not allow them to go to banks, do not allow them to go to university, can they stand up, you believe, ma'am? You know that uh, since uh, two days they announce people to go to uh, to their job, uh, especially for women. And I saw there was a news and one of the professional and uh, women activists, Maria Khadri, she was uh, on the Tulu TV and she was discussing about all the women issues. I think uh, this is the sign that it is different time uh, than 20 years ago. Interesting. Roya Rahmani, do you believe that, that women will not accept do you really believe it is possible for women to challenge the Taliban openly? Well, there, is, there are two factors. Number one, Taliban have been known to rule through a fear factor. Mm -hmm. They have always used fear as an instrument to control the society. Mm -hmm. And this is, again, very prevalent as we are looking at the situation today. 
The fact that the, we see news anchors going out and having interviews with the people, as well as even the Taliban, is definitely a good sign. But the question is, how long is it going to remain? Is it only a PR uh, stand until the, all the for, uh, forces and the presence of the international community disappears from Afghanistan? Would that remain beyond that like that? Or is that... Uh, really so do you think a it's a PR stunt? That Taliban have become more lenient. Ma'am, you're a former Afghan envoy. Do you believe it's a, it's a PR stunt to only re, uh, to try and ensure that the Western world in particular legitimizes this government, uh, endorses the, uh, the Taliban? Is that the only reason why you believe that the Taliban is talking a softer language at the moment? I, I, I think there are, again, three factors why they are doing what they are doing. Number one, they have had a taste of uh, uh, enjoying diplomatic platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, Doha gave them an opportunity to see what it means to act as a, a government. Mm -hmm. So maybe that has encouraged them to put a softer uh, um, look and, and a moderate uh, mm -hmm. look uh, to, to what they are going to do, number one. Number two is that, uh, again, it could be just a short-term uh, period, and once that, that the international community leaves, we will see a, a relapse to what they were 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And, and um, t uh, thirdly, uh, it, it really could be, the, the, what worries me the most is that every time that they talk about the rights of women, they do it with a caveat. Mm -hmm. And the caveat is within the Sharia law, within the rights that Islam has given them. So like you mentioned before, what, are, what is uh, anything that Afghan women have been doing that hasn't been in according to Islam or is not something that is already practiced in many other Muslim majority countries? In fact, Afghanistan, uh, in the past 20 years, with all the freedom that we had, mm -hmm. was rather conservative in comparison to many other Muslim-majority countries. Then, if, if they are continuously mm -hmm. hinting to that caveat, then it is worrisome for me. Okay. Uh, um, uh, Mursal Nurzai, this, yes. the, you know, the, we, is, there a, is there a sense, though, that uh, this is the question that many are asking that because of the last 20 years and the kind of freedoms that Afghan women have enjoyed, Herat uh, before, uh, up till a month ago, 50% of the students there were women. Do you believe that Afghan women will accept the clock turning back? Will the men support them? At the end of the day, women need men also to support women's rights. Will the women, women, men support women? I think Afghans, Afghan families have been um, um, have been really modern in the past, and only because of the war, all these conservative and all this um, um, bad, bad, bad image of Afghanistan and and um, uh, backward movement uh, mm -hmm. going in. The women were different, as you have just said, as I have just mentioned, from 1919 till 1929. There were so many women, as you mentioned, doctors, engineers. They were going abroad. They were doing trade. And now, exactly when the war started, all this discussion came, the women's rights. And now the women, like... Will the men uh, support the women? Do you see the course, men supporting the women? Or will the men have, also I, fall I in line? It, I see it very difficult. I see it very difficult. It's not that they will not be supporting. They don't want to support. Of course, they will want to support women, mm -hmm. as they have been doing since the last 20 years. But now the question is the fear. They will have the fear that if mm -hmm. we will support our women and they will go outside and something will happen to them, whether they will be assassinated, they will be taken or they will be raped, what will happen? Okay. What, so, uh, what so you're will saying, happen? You're saying it's the fear factor in a way that's of operating. Course. Do, Dr. Of Ho course. Okay, Dr. Homira Rezai, give us a sense of particularly in Hazara areas, in areas outside Kabul. There's a belief that outside Kabul, it'll be even worse in rural uh, uh, parts of Afghanistan, in parts of the region of yours where the Taliban have traditionally sort of tried to push the Hazaras to become second class citizens. Are the fears even greater? There are some posters, oh, some placards we are showing of women who stood up yesterday in parts of Kabul, but outside Kabul, will it get worse? Um, absolutely. We already see a lot of signs where uh, they have shut down schools for girls or the girls are only allowed to go to school up to class six. Mm -hmm. um, and, 
And for Hazaras, I think it's even there are even more concerns because Hazaras were always the second class citizens and we managed to get our constitutional rights in 2004. Since 2004 uh, till 2021, Hazaras were uh, you know, they contributed greatly in the development of the civil society, especially women, um, from music to politics to, uh, you know, we have Dr. Sima Samar, we have Dr. Sarabi. These were the women that spearheaded the change uh, in Afghanistan. And, and, and now, unfortunately, the, the district that I'm from, the literacy rate between men and women are equal. And now we're afraid that we're going to go back to what it was even pre-Taliban, Hazaras didn't have rights. Hazaras were being taxed illegally. Hazaras were the second-class citizens where we didn't have the right to go to, go to school or have jobs in the government. And unfortunately for us, we feel like that is, we're going back for another 100 years, what it was like during Abdul Rahman Khan when Hazaras massacred, Hazaras faced genocide where 62% of the Hazaras uh, were killed. And, when, and there's a lot of fear within the Hazara communities that that is what it's going to be like for the Hazaras right. with the Taliban coming. You know, Roya, you've been Afghan ambassador to the U.S. Do you feel, I want to ask a civil, do you feel betrayed today by the U.S.? You know, in all of this, the U.S., which claims to be the liberal democracy, have they left Afghans and Afghan women in particular for the Taliban to decide how, what their future is? Do you feel a little betrayed? You live today in Washington. I feel betrayed by the entire international community, including the leadership in my country. Mm -hmm. As an Afghan woman, we have been betrayed by all. We worked our blood, tears, and sweat to be where we are for a promise that did not hold. Mm -hmm. After all this 20 years, to learn and know that you are pushed back uh, to the faith that, that they can decide for you whether you can come out of the house or not, what is appropriate or not, what, what defines you as a human being or not, and basically, at, at best, a second-class citizen, if citizenship exists. Would you, would you consider, therefore, Roya, going back to Afghanistan? I would go to my country the day that I know that I would be effective, that there is a positive role for me to play, that I could contribute to its reconstruction. If that day is today or tomorrow, I am ready to go back. I'm asking this question to all three of you. Would any of you go back? Would any of you go back to uh, Afghanistan? Of course. Would, as, um, go yeah, go ahead. Uh, Hazari, go ahead. Who, who would go back? Would any of you go back? Homira Rezai, would you go back? Um, absolutely. I think, uh, as my colleague here said, is that the, the day that I'm effective in Afghanistan, uh, you know, woman in Afghanistan, like she mentioned, has been putting blood and tears in the past 20 years to give women mm -hmm. the rights, the basic human rights. And if I am to be effective in Afghanistan um, and to do that, to promote human rights, to promote women's rights, I would be more than happy to go there, or if I'm right. able to do my job more effectively from the UK, then I'll be here doing exactly that. Mursal Nurzai, would you go back ever? Um, as, as both of my sisters mentioned, um, uh, we, no matter where we live and which nationalities we hold at this um, uh, stage in life, um, at the end of the day, uh, if the country is un on peace and the bloodshed will be stopped and women will not be treated no matter where, which province and which part of the country they are from, if mm. they will not be as a woman, if they will not be treated as a second class and not be, um, and not be held in a room and captive and slaughtered, we are responsible to go back and build that country which our forefathers, which our ancestors come from. Right. So this is our responsibility to rebuild that country. But on, if I know that we are going there and we know that we will be captive and they will slaughter us, then this is jumping in a hell without knowing the um, facts. So the fear factor is something that remains a reason why perhaps women can't stand up. But as you're seeing, there are many brave voices. In fact, one of the voices who joined us earlier is at the moment in an undisclosed location within Afghanistan. And to all of you, I hope you all have the power to stand up as a collective voice. And I hope the international community stands up for the rights of women at a time like this.
They cannot be abandoned. Afghanistan cannot be abandoned in this manner. But I thank all of you for joining me on this show tonight. Thank you very much.